Welcome to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by my man, Audley Stevenson, the Odd Man. He'll unpack wisdom and insights from a cross-section of top quality performers in business, media, sports, entertainment, and lifestyle to uncover key elements to help you live your best audacious life ever. So without further ado, here is The Odd Man. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another edition of the Audacious Living Podcast. My name is Audley Stevenson, and it's a pleasure to be here with you as always as we continue our goal of helping you live your best audacious life ever. Uh, Our social media channels uh, are just one of the great ways to connect with us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I would encourage you to give us a like, follow, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button, and immediately stay connected. Now, on today's episode, I'll be welcoming Nick Shaw to the podcast. Uh, He's a co-founder and CEO of Renaissance Periodization, which is a fitness and coaching company that works and trains with top athletes to help them achieve their fitness goals. Now, given Nick's professional background, his book that he recently wrote only makes sense because it's called Fit for Success, which actually is a perfect fit. Uh, So it makes total sense. Um, Actually, the, the full title of his book is called Fit for Success, Lessons on Achievement and Leading your best life and hey again talk about making sense it's only fitting that he's on the audacious living podcast where our goal is to help you live your best audacious life ever so really really excited to have nick pop by and so here's the thing you know there are habits and traits that are common amongst the high achievers so for example if you were to line up all the most successful people in the world that you know, and that could be success professionally or personally, and you analyze each of those things that help those individuals get to the level that that they're at, you're gonna find a common thread. It's our job to find out what that commonality is and figure it out, figure out how we can apply it to our own lives. Now, Nick's book is a a really good tool that will help with that. You know, I think he did a great job by skillfully drawing out a roadmap, if you will, that helps us identify and implement those habits to help us find the success I was talking about earlier. It's a, a great combo that I think all of you will will absolutely appreciate and you'll walk away uh, with some absolutely great insights. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Nick. Enjoy. In his new book, Fit for Success, Lessons on Achievement and Leading Your Best Life, Nick Shaw details the common habits and traits that exist within successful people and how we can adopt those exact same habits to thrive despite our circumstances. Nick is coming up next on the Audacious Living Podcast. All right. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Nick Shaw, thank you for for being here. Um, uh, Fit for Success is, is the title of your book. Fit for Success, Lessons on Achievement and Leading Your Best Life. I think that's a, a great title across the board. Um, sort of talk about the, the, the impetus for that book because Renaissance Periodization is your fitness and coaching brand or company, if you will. You're the CEO of that company, but you're an author now too. Like, was that part of the plan for you to be a book author? Uh, no, it never was. So I, I'll give you a little bit of backstory and, and for anyone listening. So our 2020, uh, my wife and we have two small kids, we live in Charlotte, North Carolina. But anyways, we start off 2020. So we go back in time, January 2020, four or five days before my son's eighth birthday. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife is unexpectedly diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. Mm. And she's doing well now, though. Knock on wood, of course, but she's doing very, very well. But uh, so this is how our 2020 starts. And... She has uh, surgery in February, uh, 
uh, some complications from that. She was in the hospital for like a week. Uh, she started chemo in, in March of 2020. Wow. And then of course we know what happened course, in yeah. March of 2020. Yeah. So like this all happens and we would say, all right, well, that's pretty bad just by itself. Then we threw on coronavirus, COVID, the pandemic. And given she was in the middle of chemo, we had to take quarantine very, very seriously. Absolutely. So we were quarantined for three, four months, really hardcore. Because if we go back in time, uh, maybe now you could say like, all right, well, uh, and some people would say, I don't know, but like maybe in hindsight, I don't know, maybe didn't necessarily like, you could maybe leave your house, but no one knew that at the time. We thought it was just, you couldn't leave your house, you couldn't do anything. And so I had uh, a few months of downtime and I thought to myself, well, I know that we're going through this. And I, I kind of had been thinking and had these ideas in my head for a while. And I started writing them down one day. And it's a little bit different if you're just kind of theorizing stuff, just, you know, right. I, I think like these might be some good ideas. Like if you want to be successful, you need to do these things. But then really through all that time and through 2020, really having to, to live these principles, these habits yeah. every single day, like you had to actually live them in order to, to really get through everything that was going on. And right. I sort of said to myself, well, I'm not going anywhere for a while. I think that I'm onto something here. I think this is a really good time to, to do this. And so that's kind of how the book came about. So I never really had you know, long-term plans to be an author, but I just right. thought given 2020, given everything that was going on, right. boy, this just seems like a really good time to have something like this. So you became an author by accident. Is that uh, what I'm hearing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. There we go. I like that. That's uh, very well said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, we'll, 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 sorry, we'll, we'll certainly get into your book and, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the periods of success and how you've laid them all out. Um, um, before we do that, I, I want to sort of talk because the one of the overarching themes is really around m mindset and mm -hmm. the significance to uh, to to that to the connection to our success. I want to sort of, sort of touch on that and and sort of how important you know the importance of mindset. Yeah, totally. I think it's really really important. So the, the habits in the book are laid out based on a pyramid. So you kind of have the the most important ones at the very bottom, and you work your way up. And I think a lot of them are all interrelated. So a uh, positive mindset is actually the third habit of success. But right below that, I think really ties in well, is the idea of internal locus of control, which everyone knows what this means. That's just kind of maybe the, the quote unquote fancy terminology for it. So your locus of control basically means is, is something happening to you and you can't really control it? Or do you believe that your actions matter and you can influence outcomes? And I think ultimately having the more internal looks of control or you focus on the things that you know you can control versus things that you can't, uh, you're going to be much better off. And they actually kind of tie together. So people that are more hopeful, well, they're more hopeful and that the future is going to be better because they actually know that their actions matter. So right. just a slight difference between hopeful and, uh, and optimistic. Optimistic, you just sort of think things will be better. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think they're going to be fine. But right. if you're hopeful, you actually you're hopeful because you know that your actions matter. And then funny thing about this, so below internal locus of control, the most important part of success is actual work ethic. And if you're hopeful because your actions matter, well, what's then gonna happen? Well, you know what you do matters, you're going to do more of that, you know, whatever it is, whatever you're trying to be successful at. So mindset's, I think really everything in, actually funny story, if I may share this, yeah. The first rough draft that I had, had mindset at the bottom. It's like, yes, this is the most important part. So uh, it's just funny how that all kind of works out. Cause I would definitely agree with you. Yeah, no, it's uh well, again, it's a, it's a, I think, as you said, it's somewhere in the book, it's a pillar of success, right? Like that's, that's what it is. And uh, that positive mindset, it, it sort of feeds everything else. And, and, and what I found is that when you start to sort of build up those successes, it just, it just, it, 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 your confidence increases, yeah. uh, you gain momentum, uh, you start to sort of feel unstoppable, so to speak, because you've got all these wins under your belt, right? So I think that all kind of sort of falls under that, I'd say. Absolutely. So it's not necessarily in the book per se, but a lot of thinking that I've been doing since the book was out is really about to be successful. It almost takes a little bit of success, which seems really uh, funny to say that, <clears throat> but it, it is important in that you do get the confidence. You start really small, you get some little wins, you start feeling good about yourself, you're more confident, 
Right. What happens? Usually you're more confident. Well, now you're going to start taking more action. And it, it kind of is this little snowball effect where it starts to happen like that. So um, there's actually a book, I think it's called like the, I forget the exact name of it, but uh, they have like these five laws of success. And it was written by this you know, educator who studies mm-hmm. this stuff. And that's actually one of them. Like it actually takes a little bit of success to be successful. And right. Right. Step back and think about that. You're like, well, oh, gee, all right, thanks for that. But, you know, but it, it is, there's something to it, man. Momentum yes. is a very real thing. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so let, let's get into the pillars, if you will, uh, um, and start off with work ethic being your first one. And uh, something I thought was interesting, you talked about hard work being overrated. I wonder if you sort of explain that a bit, because that would sort of catch people off guard a little bit going, what do you mean hard work's overrated? Like, we're supposed to work hard, right? Yeah, so a lot of people, I mean, you just hear that everywhere. So what's funny about the, the book is that, yes, it, it's the bottom of the pyramid, so it's the most important. And that just means in order to actually achieve any success, you actually have to take your ideas and and put them into action. You can't just become successful by thinking about it. Right. Um, But then you you take that and you go, all right, well, I know that I need to actually take action and do something. And that's really where it comes from. But it's actually the shortest chapter in the book Hmm. because it's like, well, how much can you really say about work? Like everyone knows you need to work hard. But the the thing that I found found the, the, the funniest and you know, maybe you could relate to this too. Uh, so I, you know, I'm able to work with some athletes and it's really cool to work with yeah. high-level athletes. But really the amount of work that you have to put in to, to be good and then great mm. and then elite and then almost above that, you have like the very best in the world. The amount of work that they put in, it's just really unreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's inspiring, I think, because I'll, I'll see some, you know, like CrossFit Games champions that we work with and I'm just like, yeah you're going back to the gym, like, holy yeah. crap, that's, uh, that's something, it's awesome. Well, the, the, yeah, the level of dedication that's required, I mean, that just, you know, again, it's, 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 it's you can clearly see why there's a separation from the, the elite level athletes and everyone else because of that dedication they got to put in. And yeah, so, I mean, I think back, so we work with Rich Froning and I've seen his work ethic mm. and it reminds me of one of my favorite players of all time, Kobe Bryant. Right. And you, you hear the stories of his work ethic and it's just something I think that we could all truly marvel at because, I mean, I want to be successful, but I don't know if I would have what it takes to, you know, to potentially outwork him. And I think that speaks to this combination of, you know, raw talent that he had, but also like you're just not going to outwork the guy. And if you take those two things right. and combine them, well, that's why you get someone that's arguably, you know, the best player of all time. So, mm-hmm. so it's, it's really cool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how, how does one, and I don't know if this is a fair question, but how, how does one improve their work ethic then? Like it's, it's, I mean, sometimes the answer seems simple, just work harder, right? Isn't that kind of what the answer is or there's more to it? Well, I think there's a little bit to that and that you start talking about the, the momentum involved and it does take a little bit of action and, and some of that work ethic to get going and that can actually increase your desire to do more because you see some of the rewards that you're getting from that. So that's, that's a big part of it. You can also improve, right? Because you can improve your abilities, mm-hmm. which kind of ties into the growth mindset, which you know, we might touch on later. But if you, if you know that, you're going to want, you're going to study more, you're going to uh, learn more, you're going to practice more, you're going to you know, train with weights, whatever it is, like you're going to try to improve your right. abilities. So that's one way. And then the last way is really just your commitment to working hard. And I think honestly, you can do something as easily as making a daily to-do list or some sort of list where you just know what you need to do. And then you just set about doing that every single day. And again, like, I, I think if you do, I mean, I, I started doing that a, a handful of months ago and I mean, it just feels good to check those things off. And right. it does give you a little bit of that, uh, that momentum. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Like I feel good. Yeah. Let's right. keep going. And then you're, you're more motivated to do it the next day. Awesome. Awesome. Um, the, the, the next point, internal locus of control, you touched on it earlier. Um, and I've, I have to admit that was a new terminology for me. I, I hadn't heard that before. Uh, so I had to, to, to actually go back and sort of read over that again, because it was all, again, it was, it was new. Uh, I understand the concept, um, sure, yeah. but uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the language I hadn't. So I wonder if you sort of talk about that a little bit more, if you don't mind. Yeah, the, the simplest way I think is really focusing on the things you actually have control over. Mm. That's your internal locus of control. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a good example is <clears throat> if it rains, 
we can't control the weather, right? That's right. What can we control? Well, we could control if we wear rain boots, if we take an umbrella with us, or uh, maybe traffic is impacted because of rain or whatever it is, right? We can't control traffic, unfortunately. Uh, but what could you do? You could leave earlier, right? That's just something in your control. Right. Or maybe you could take an alternative route that's more in your control. And uh, Successful people tend to focus on the things that they actually have some say or some control over. Um, another example, and I don't, this is, actually isn't in the book, but I've been thinking about this a lot uh, recently. So with chemotherapy, you know, my wife is going to lose her hair and mm -hmm. you can't control that. Right. So what did we do? Well, as soon as she started treatment, we said, you know what? Let's just go ahead and, and, and let's just buzz your hair. And uh, I, you know, I have short hair. So I was like, okay, cool. Like I'll buzz mine. That's fine. And my eight-year-old son was like, oh yeah, I'm in. Like, absolutely. And so we all did that. I was on one night, you know, we took a picture and it just, it gives you this tiny, this tiny amount of control back. Yeah. And now you kind of know like, okay, yeah, all this bad stuff's coming, but it's not over. We're not, you know, out of the fight. We, we still have some say in what's going on. And I think that's a pretty powerful and, uh, and cool story to share with people because yeah. you can't control that that's going to happen. It's just, it is what it is, but you can control well, when it happens. And you know, that, that's a pretty good feeling. I think to get back some of that. And there's one of these things where, you know, you know, obviously everything else that, that happened was, was, you know, bad and you know, wouldn't let that happen. But you know, that's, that's a story we'll remember the rest of our lives. Sure. 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 That, that giving up control thing is tough for people, Nick. I mean, you know, the whole idea of, um, you know, and for people who like to have control, if you like to have control of everything, their days, and they plan everything out and all of a sudden to not have that control. So this is a tough one for people because control is so important for them. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you nailed it. it. Someone said when they read the book, they thought one of the biggest takeaways was there's, there's an idea of balance involved. And I think that's a really good way to look at it because if you are so, focused on controlling every, every single aspect, right. you're going to have a rough time because there's obviously just things that we cannot control, no matter what we do. The, the weather, the, the, you know, right. the chemotherapy, th those are good examples of it, but there's a ton of other examples, right? So you just kind of have to have that balance where really something happens to you. You don't have to immediately respond to it. You don't have to react to it. You can kind of right. step back and you know then choose your best course of action. And you know just imagine working in a a, a normal kind of quote unquote normal job. Uh, I guess everything's not really normal anymore. With virtual changed. Working. Normal yeah. change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's new normal for sure. But you know, sometimes you just can't control the way other people act and the things they do. But you, know, you can always control how you respond to things. And yeah, it, it, it's it's a simple but not easy concept to grasp. And and that's a big takeaway for me is because I'm by no means perfect at all this stuff. And sure. You know, I'll, get too emotional about things that I shouldn't or overreact. Uh, maybe a good example because the uh, NCAA tournament's on right now right. In, in basketball is uh, you know, sports. And sure. I used to be really, really guilty of this where I'm a huge Michigan fan yep. and Michigan football or, or basketball even, well, if they're not doing well, I'm probably not going to be super happy. Man. And my, yeah, you know how it is, right? I do. I do. I feel, as you said that, I'm like, yeah, I can think of lots of moments where I lost a night's sleep or yeah. I've been cranky or in a bad mood over something I have absolutely no control over. You know, when a, a, a coach calls a play in that timeout, it's the players I have to execute, not me, right? But I still, you know, and, and whether it's whether they have success with it or not, I'm still reacting. So I, I get it what you're saying loud and clear. Yeah. And man, for the longest time, my, my family would tell me this. That they're like, you're like certifiably insane when you watch Michigan sports. And I said, no, 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 you, you just don't get it. You don't understand. Like you just, <laughs> you just don't get it. And you know, then I'm going message boards and you see other people that are just as crazy as you. You're like, yeah, okay, these people get me. And then just really just being more cautious of all this stuff the last, you know, year and a half, two years, yep. I'm just, I mean, now I can watch a game and I'm just like, okay. Yeah, that stinks. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I want them to win because, you know, I enjoy watching it and stuff, but it doesn't really impact my days or moods anymore. I'm just, no, yeah. uh, you know, that's what it is. But it, it's, a, again, it's simple, but it's not easy because it takes a long time to you know, actually yeah. do this. So hopefully my family uh, will want, enjoy watching sports with me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Tell him I'm a changed man. I'm a changed man. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to argue here. Okay? <laughs> uh, the next one is powerful mindset, and um, this is another uh, a good one because it again, I think th- this is one of those ones that really just frame the way your thinking frames the way things go, right? And uh, and having that powerful mindset, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's why I said uh, when I originally did the, the first pyramid, I had it at the bottom because I think you have to have some level of self-belief or something internally mm. in order to, to really get going. And that's kind of what my, was my original thought around it. Uh, one of the coolest takeaways from positive mindset for me is really the growth mindset. Right. So if you have someone with a fixed mindset, they're, they're, they're more likely to give up easier because they sort of think that their talents or abilities or whatever it is are innate. They can't really do much about it. Right. And it's just, boy, that's just not a good way to approach things, right? Like we can learn, we can practice. Now there's probably some limits to that, of course. Sure. But you know, are you ever going to tell an athlete, you know, that steps on the court of basketball and you know, maybe they're five, eight or five, nine, like myself, I'm unfortunately not that tall, but boy, I could, stronger i could probably get faster i could just work harder uh funny story so i wasn't a very good basketball player growing up Mm -hmm. but i worked hard i would hustle Mm -hmm. so i was good at defense so usually the coach would be like hey go guard the other team's best player right follow them around full court like do whatever you need to and i'm like done sign me up like yes i can do that Yep. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't the person, you know, taking 15 shots a game because no. uh, that's, that's not the best strategy, but again, like I just, I knew that I could do something and, and that was, I guess, playing to my strengths, but it's really just the whole growth mindset and, and knowing that you can probably do some things to grow and prove and get better. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's a, a great analogy, right? Like, you know, we all have specific skill sets that we, you know, we, we, we can perform at. And you see the pro level all the time now, right? Where, you know, this one player, all they can do is, hey, you're my three point shooter. When I bring you in, your job is to hit that corner three or, you know, your job is to defend uh, the best offensive player or whatever. And so, so I think that's if, if people are allowed to play to their strengths more and, and or not even allowed to, but recognize that they can then I think that will do a lot in terms of building that positive, that powerful mindset. Well, a perfect example of that. Now that we're, I got, you know, basketball in the mind, of course. We're on it. Are, are you familiar with uh, Duncan Robinson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great so, shooter. Again, a phenomenal shooter. So this is a guy that started off as a D3 college, right? He, no one knew of him. He, uh, one of his coaches there, and I forget what school it was, knows John Beeline up in Michigan. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you got to take a flyer on this guy. Like you, you need this guy. So he transfers in and he ends up uh, being an integral part of their uh, 2018 runner up uh, Michigan when they lost to Villanova. Yep. And then no one thought he was undrafted. No one thought he was going to be really anything. You know, like maybe he'll play in the G league or whatever, which is still awesome. Sure. He goes undrafted. He makes the Heat roster. And what happens last year? I mean, the Heat make the finals. This guy's shooting, what, like 45% from yeah. three beds? It's Ridiculous. insane. And I'm sure he's probably going to have a very lucrative next contract coming up because, you know, he does what he's good at. And right. That, boy, there's a lot to be said about uh, what doing that. And there are specific roles that, that people need. Yeah, sports is great for that because they give all kinds of st- great stories and, and and really cool lessons like Duncan's is an example and there have been many others too. But yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great one. That's a great one. Uh, oh, and, and it is just a really cool story because you're talking about a D3 guy yeah. to a starter in the NBA finals. Like that's yeah. crazy. No, no one recognizes all that's gone on between from that leap that you're from D3 to NBA starter in the finals. There's a lot that's gone on in between there that people may not recognize, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> totally. Uh, and again, I think some people, you know, especially with social media and such, they, they kind of only see that finished product. And we, we wrongly assume that, you know, and maybe this goes back into the fixed mindset because you don't really see the five, the 10 no. years of just you know, grueling grunt work, what just hard work, whatever it is, you kind of only see the highlight reel and then you you get a little bit biased. You're not sure. Oh, well, you know, this guy's starter in the NBA. He must be, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever, but 
doesn't really work like that. No, it's a lot to it. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, the, the next pillar uh, in the pyramid is discipline. And I got to tell you, I, I think I have a personal bias to this one. Uh, I think, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, different people will gravitate ones that they feel or that resonate with them are important. I think discipline is for me. <laughs> well, uh, likewise, uh, if someone were to ask me like, hey, what's like the number one takeaway or, you know, what's the most important one? I would be hard pressed not to say discipline. And again, just the, the more I've thought about it, you know, since the book's been out and, and whatnot. And it's talked about a little bit in there, but the idea of delayed gratification and having in general, just a longer term time horizon on how you think about things, I, I think is one of the, probably the, the most important parts of, of being successful and in really any, any endeavor that, mm -hmm. that you're after. Uh, sports is a good example, of course. Uh, I love to talk about personal finances when it comes to delayed gratification mm -hmm. because you know, what are the examples? If you start investing just a little bit, right? It doesn't have to be crazy. Like when you're 20 years old, yep. uh, what happens? You know, you can stop at 30 and you're going to have more than the person that starts at 30. So right. kind of just the, the longer term that you can think and, and be able to delay some of that gratification versus just wanting to go after the things that are appealing now. Right. Fancy, fancy car, you know, whatever it is, right? There's a million different things we can list, but it's uh, when you think of it from a longer term time horizon, I think that's just what people do. And again, health and fitness, which is you know, my background, also gives the, the perfect examples because, well, are you going to do this stuff that's probably not going to feel that great now? You know, go work out and push yourself right. and all that. But boy, it's going to be better long term if you're able to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, the, the book writing process, for example, that requires discipline. It doesn't matter uh, how much energy. And you know, and it's funny because maybe at the beginning you may have a lot of energy, right? And, and some, you know, that energy will only take you so far. And it's that discipline that you need to sustain it to keep going. And uh, and that's oftentimes a gap, right? Like between you know starting and that finished pro the finished process is that discipline piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely, a lot of people when they start something, they're super motivated. They're inspired. Yep. And I think a lot of folks wrongly assume, and we see this all the time at RP, people get really fired up when they start new fitness goals because they see something maybe on social media and they're like, yes, I want that. I am ready. I, I am going to do this. I'm so motivated. And then a week or two goes by, maybe mm. a little bit longer, depends mm. on the person. And then they start to realize how much work is required to get to their goals. So that's actually why I think it's really important to, when you get started on something, to right. have realistic goals. Mm. Because what we see in fitness is people will way overdo their weight loss goals. They're like, yes, I want to lose 50 pounds. I'm like, okay, awesome. Yeah, hey, that's going to take six, 12 months, like if you want to do it the right way. Right. But people are like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm going to do this in two months or three months. Yeah. And that's not a, not a great idea uh, to, to, to put that lightly. And then they'll get a couple of weeks in, they have that initial success. So maybe they're still feeling good, but then about the first time they hit a plateau or things go a little bit off track, mm. they're, they're very likely to fall off because the goals that they set were just so hard, so aggressive right. that it's just really not sustainable. You, 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 you touched, I think in, that, in, in your response, you sort of touched on motivation and you talked about inspiration. I wonder if you can talk about the difference between the two, because that's something that, uh, that they are very different. I wonder if you can sort of touch on that. Yeah. So motivation, inspiration is usually what gets you started. You see something or whatever it is, but there's some, there's some little spark that, that gets you going. You're like, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. Let's do this. Let's get after it. Awesome. That is, it's just not sustainable. Then mm. it provides you some energy to get going. Yes, absolutely. So it's great, but you have to know going in and you have to expect that motivation, that inspiration, they're going to go away and pretty quickly they're going to go away first couple of weeks or something. And you have to replace that really with discipline and then habits. Cause if you have discipline, you're going to keep doing it. Even if you don't want to, right. You're going to build the habits. And then once you have those habits, things start to become more automatic. Once they become more automatic, what usually happens is people start to then identify with it. They're like, you know, uh, Oh yeah, 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 I've been working out for you know three months. Like, yeah, like I'm I'm the type of person that goes to the gym or something like that. Once you get to that point, boom, like 
your, your goal. It's a hard point to get to. Don't get me wrong. Mm. If you can sort of go through that process, that's you know, really what it takes. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's important. Right. And again, one gets you started and one keeps you going. Right. And understand that they both, you know, work hand in hand and it's just a matter of knowing, you know, when you need one versus the other, right. Like whether it gets started or keep going. So I get you loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Uh, yeah, uh, pur purpose is, is is the next one. I think this is another important one. They're all important, Nick. It's so hard to kind of identify yeah. this, but they're all important, right? And I, I, I probably could say that for each and every pillar as we go through this, but purpose is another one that gives us direction, right? Absolutely. I mean, you nailed it. It gives you, it gives you purpose, right? It's, it's kind of using the, the, the term and the definition, but uh, really just kind of gives you your why, your, your overall mm. meaning and Myself, I've always been into fitness. I've always been into sports. So I just always kind of knew that I was going to do something related to that. <clears throat> but uh, it certainly helps when your purpose, your, your whatever it is, your, your overall reason for wanting to do stuff, it's just kind of part of who you are and you really love it. Because when you do have those inevitable failures or slip ups or tough moments or that inspiration fades, right? just kind of knowing why you do something just helps you get through and, you know, it's going to vary from person to person, of course, but if you have that, know that it's just really this helpful tool to get you through the hard times. Mm -hmm. the, the, the why piece is, is important because I think what it also does, you can hold yourself accountable through your actions, right? Like, like if this is what my goal is, this is my purpose is, then, you know, my actions should be aligned with my purpose. And if they're not, that's where you ask yourself, well, why am I doing this? And so it's a, I think it's a really good accountability measure. Yeah, I think that's very well said. I think that's a good way to look at it. And usually they say, if you have goals, right, you should write them down or something. Mm. You just you keep looking at them day after day. And, you know, that's kind of your, your purpose. That's why you're doing it. And that's probably going to be a, another motivating factor. Maybe some days you won't have that. But again, you look at it and you kind of think back to why you originally set those goals or what, you know, what was the reason for it. And it's probably just going to help you get through all those tough times and those tough times are going to come. Don't, uh, don't be mistaken there. They are going to come. Uh, you said you touched on tough times. I think that's a good segue into the next one, which is failure. And that's a, that's a tough one for people, right? Uh, I mean, to embrace failure isn't always an easy thing, Nick. <laughs> it's certainly not easy. And it's really funny because you think of a book as on success. Why would it talk about failure? Mm. Really the, the reason is that you're always going to fail. You're always going to slip up. You're always going to make mistakes. Uh, do you know anyone that's perfect? I've, I've, I've yet to meet them, right? So uh, that's just part of it. And a lot of people, I think, wrongly assume, again, that if they do fail, that it's like game over. Right. I mean, how many perfect teams are there out there? Right. There's, ne there's never, I mean, well, one, I guess, 1976 Indiana Hoosiers. But like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah you, you get to college level or pro level, the idea right. of perfection is, is really not there. And so you just have to know, you have to know going in that you are probably going to lose at times. You're going you're gonna to fail. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. And it's actually totally okay because everyone does. And if you know that, you sort of just embrace that, that you reach a stumbling block or a hurdle or whatever it is. And you, it just happens. And then you learn from it, you grow from it, you get better, and then you just don't repeat that process again. Mm -hmm. Well, it, and I think um, you know, the, the important thing with failures is that uh, uh, taking the, the, the lessons away. So I, I, I don't know if I even, the, the, the language, uh, I think that we, we could probably even change that language because, you know, failures are just setbacks and, you know, setbacks doesn't mean that you can't recover from them or, or they're challenges or obstacles, you know, however you want to categorize them. But the important piece in all this is, is, is the lesson that you can walk away from to do better in the future. Absolutely. And then that ties back into the growth mindset. You have a stumbling block, you just learn from it, you get better and that's it. You just keep moving forward and you know, you're going to have some of those same stumbling blocks again later on and you right. just learn from it, adapt and keep going. <clears throat> and I do think there's a couple that there's probably a slightly better way to fail. And uh, I'll just briefly touch on those if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, you probably need to fail small and this is probably a bit more relevant for maybe like entrepreneur types, but you have to fail small. 
and that you're not gonna, you don't sort of dive in to the deep end of the pool, you know, when you've never swam before, right? That's probably not a good idea. So you wanna start small, because if you do fail, it's not gonna, it's not game over. Right. You can recover from it. Yes. And so you fail small and you fail early. So the earlier on in the process, well, hopefully you're gonna learn from that and keep going. And you fail early versus fail late. So you don't have hopefully as much tied into it, mm. right? Like if you yep. are working a nine to five or something like that, and you just one day 100% quit to start this new thing. I mean, it might work out, but it might not also work out. So mm-hmm. maybe you're better off keeping that main job and just doing a little bit on the side. And it kind of, because what happens if that fails? Well, you still right. have your nine to five and you have some of that security that's probably an okay way to go about it. Some people might argue otherwise, and that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. There's probably something to be said when you sort of reach that critical point that maybe you do have to dive in both feet. Yeah. So you don't have that, you know, little thing in the back of your head going, oh, it's okay. You don't have to, there's something to be said there for sure. Right. And then uh, probably the third part of a failure is fail often, which is mm. really, really weird. But that just really means you, you get your ideas out there you learn from them, uh, the idea of just iteration. So we have an app and boy, I mean, we get our app out there and get feedback from customers all the time. And sure, sure. Uh, certainly not all of it's positive. Right? <laughs> People love to be very vocal about their uh, you know, negative reviews. But sure. again, it helps us get feedback. It helps us improve. It helps us get better. And we, we take that feedback. Maybe we add more features or we... Sure change something, whatever it is. And then we get it back out there. I'm like, Oh, Hey, we took your feedback. Now we have this, let us know what you think. And then it's like that whole process just keeps repeating itself time after time after time. Yep. 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 And that's it. I think that's the key in this. It doesn't, you don't let it hold you back and then let it put you down. You sort of, what, what can you take from this and move forward? And I think that's the, the, the key. We, we just still gotta keep, keep moving forward, Nick. So that's the key in all this. So it's important. Yeah. A good basketball analogy. Again, uh, the NCAA tournaments right now, but the, the good coaches, they're going to have a game plan in place, but once the game starts, like you don't know how the other team is going to react necessarily. Don't. So what's it about making in-game adjustments? Because mm-hmm. maybe the, the couple of sets that you had planned up that you knew for sure were going to work on this team because they're used to you know playing this type of defense. You kick them in, they don't work. Right? Right. Like, oh, well, that was a failure. Now you got to adjust. Like, All right, well, we've seen that they're now overplaying this. So now let's do this. Like that's Yep. It's, it's part of the process i'm reminded of uh, i think it's a mike tyson quote talks about the fact that you know you, you know your game plan goes out the window those you know the first time the other guy punches you in your mouth right like <laughs> it changes yeah. it all <laughs> right yeah what's gonna happen if i get punched in the face i don't know yeah exactly exactly uh l- l- last pillar is recharge and i thought and i thought this was uh certainly in the fitness space i can understand the importance of of, of recharging and um uh, um uh, uh rejuvenization you know of your muscles and and of yourself i i t- truthfully i never really thought of it in, this, in the context of success so i think this is a, an important this is an important learning for me as well yeah totally so i think uh, a lot of people just assume if you're going to be successful it's always just go 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 Mm. Your foot is on the gas pedal 24 seven. You just, you're never stopping. You're just always grinding. You know, that's a really popular term out there on social media and all that. <laughs> and there are times where you're going to need that for sure, especially early on to kind of you know break through some of those initial barriers, get that uh, momentum that we talked about earlier. Yep. But if you only do that, we're all human, right? We have sort of limited resources and time. You only want to do that. Only go, 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 go. You're probably going to burn out at some point. Mm. What's the saying? You're you're burning the candle at both ends. Okay. So it's right. eventually you're going to you know, get to nothing left sooner. <laughs> and um, that's a very real thing. So it's a tough thing to, to learn and understand. And you know, if you're an early entrepreneur, let's say, it's tough to do that because mm. you know it's all on you probably. Sure. You're, you're yeah. are really motivated. Yeah. Absolutely, right? Yeah. But it's... You know, if you only do that, and, and I was actually guilty of this because early on, it was mostly just my wife and I answering all of like our customer service emails and all that stuff. This is 2015, 2016. And we, uh, we made it a point where we would never go to bed without making sure all emails were caught up. Wow. And it takes a toll after a while. It does. It does. We, were, we were doing this for, you know, literally months and months and on end and stuff. 
and it helped set the foundation for us, of course. So we were sort of known that we were going to reply and, yep. and make sure we got back with people and, and treat them right and all that. So it's definitely paid off, but there were definitely some points where we were kind of teetering on that burnout stage. Yes. yes. Like, man, we were, we were really close. And so it forced us to, uh, to get some outside help and, and let other people hop in and, and do that. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have a little more time. We're not as stressed out. And uh, again, we had two small kids at the time. Right. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that, yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, again, uh, to, to put that, you know, those demands on you, and I just, I totally understand why. So I'm not at all, you know, arguing the logic or anything like behind that at all. I get it. But uh, wow, that's, that's, that's a lot to put on yourself. So the recharge is important. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. You, you got to recharge. You got to, <clears throat> you got to kind of take some time for yourself so you don't get burnt out. And uh, really, I think probably focus on, you know, self-improvement too, yeah. because if you want to be in this game for a long time, right, you have that long-term time horizon. Well, where you're at now, and it's hopefully not where you're going to be in five, 10, 15, 20 years. So again, this is a mistake that I made because we were so busy. I wasn't taking the time to read. I wasn't taking the time to, you know, take courses online to better myself because I just mm. felt that I couldn't do it. Or if I did ever have any free time, I'm like, I just want to relax and not do anything. And then once we, we got a little bit more of that balance back, then eventually that, that light bulb went back on where I was like, why am I not trying to better myself? Why am I not trying to read more, learn more? And so right. that's part of the, the recharge process for me because like, now I like doing these things. I like, I love reading. I love, you know, just how can I get better? What can I yeah. possibly do to get better? I don't really even care what it is. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's fitness. Maybe it's mindset. Maybe it's, you name it. But I want to be trying to push myself to get better in some capacity. Got you. Got you. I think one thing that I, that I uh, really appreciate about your book and uh, you know, again, I'll say it's overall job well done, uh, but I re really appreciate the level of research and, 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 and information that you put even from, from other sources and other books and, and the couple that you said, Oh, I've got to pick that book up and, and look at it myself because it was just uh, uh, insightful in terms of some of the off the, the points that you made. So I, I think congratulations on that for sure. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. So I really wanted this to be, so if you look at only one person, if you only look at, you know, hey, so-and-so has been successful. Why is that? Right. If you only look at one person, it's entirely possible that they could just be lucky. Mm. So this book wasn't intended to like be about myself personally, because I just, I don't think there's a whole lot you can learn from just any one person. Sure. You can draw some insights, of course, absolutely. But I think the key really is then you start looking at, at other successful people or maybe people that, that didn't quite make it. They're not as success, successful. Right. Or let's look ac across different genres. So fitness, I know pretty well, I work with some high level athletes. Cool. Let's, what are they, what do these people have in common? Mm -hmm. uh, now let's look at, you know, business and, and finance or, you know, whatever it is. And then these elements, these prin principles, these habits, well, they're universal. All these people that are successful, they, they tend to share these things. Yes. And so that's really for me what it was. And you know, I'm reading all these different books about all these different people or different genres. And I'm like, huh, well, what this person said here actually sounds a lot like what this person said. And right. so that's why I started to tie this in. And that's why there's so many book references, because I think it's just, uh, it's almost like a literature review. So instead of having to read, you know, uh, 50 self help books, well, kind of just read this one and it's going to yeah. give you like the, the key elements that are that's sort of right. sifted. No, that's, that's right. No, no, you absolutely. And that's, that's sort of one of my takeaways from it, the level of, uh, of uh, uh, detail with respects to other reference sources and um, a lot of really, really good ones. So again, congrats on that. Um, one last thing Nick, I, that I want to ask and before we go, and again, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. It's been great chatting with you. Uh, but I'm just wondering, so as you're going through, as you, got, as you went through this book writing process, as, as we, we dubbed you the accidental author, right? As you've gone through this book writing process, what kind of things did you learn or what was a learning that you, you took from it as you were going through this process? Yeah, the, the writing process is really, really interesting. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about it. And so uh, about the first day after the book released, maybe the first week, I was like, huh, I wish I would have done about 10 things differently. <laughs> but now next time, maybe, maybe there's another book or different colleagues want to do a book. I'm going to be like, okay, 
go back to my list. I'm going to be like, all right, so let's change these five, 10 things, you know, whatever they are. Right. <clears throat> um, I would probably do a little bit more research on book promotion in general okay. because the, the, the publishing process is a really long process. So I didn't kind of go the traditional route, you know, of like a normal big publishing house. It just takes a long time. And maybe I was, I wrongly had a shorter term time horizon. Maybe I should have had a longer one, whatever. But I knew that I wanted to get the book out before 2020. Ended. So that was really my main motivating drive there. So that's why I went with more of like a, a hybrid approach where I had the rough draft. They came in and edited it, you know, made me sound smart, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, it was able to, to go to print a little bit quicker. So that it was it was really cool. But, you know, it's one of those things, just learn, learn a lot. And, you know, it's really fun. It's, it's really cool to, you know, to be able to, to talk with other folks about it and people that have read the book, uh, the reviews seem you know, very, very positive so far. So it's just a really cool uh, feeling and, and hopefully it's helping a lot of people out there. I think it will. I think even, even from the, uh, again, the success principles that you laid out, I think they all were, they're, they're helpful and people will, again, depend, no, 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 it's going to depend on where you are individually and what, you know, you connect with, but uh, there's something that will resonate with people. And that, and that's the important thing. And all this is you, you, you've obviously written this as a tool to help other people. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a couple of main things that I wanted to make sure the book was not super long, you know, Hey, let's just kind of get right to it. Let's get to the main points. That was one of them. I mean, you could read this book in probably a day, if you really, mm-hmm. you know, 160 pages, something like that. Yeah. But also, too, I wanted some uh, like actionable take-home messages at the end of each chapter. And I was like, like those are kind of my two non-negotiables. I was like, I don't want this to be some 400-page book that you know people are going to get bored halfway through. It's like, no, let's not do that. And a lot of times you'll read a book and you're like, oh, that was cool. Like, now what do I do? And so I wanted to make sure there's at least a little bit of something. So at the end of each chapter, there's just like this quick little kind of take home thing you can do. And if you just start doing those things, you're, you're going to be more successful, whatever it is you're after. Got you. So in, in addition to being an author, you're also a podcaster too. I might add, should add that as well. I, you, keep, you keep yourself busy, Nick. Yeah. Um, so we have a, we have a pretty big uh, group of people that use our RP products and stuff. And so the podcast is really just uh, kind of like Q and a Q&A or getting some of our coaches on there to talk about things that are going to be relevant to them. So it's gotcha. like, you know, mostly mostly nutrition stuff a little bit of training in there as well so uh, for example like we, we had a three-month challenge that started you know at the start of the year kind of a lot of people are coming close to the end of the challenge now so a lot of the topics we're talking about is like all right well you got some success that's awesome you've achieved you know maybe your goals lose 10 15 20 pounds whatever it was that's all cool but now what now what do you do how do you kind of make sure that you are successful long term and so it's just right. different things like that Got you, got you, got you. Uh, so Nick, where can we send our, our, our listeners to if they wanted to either pick up a copy of their book or more information about you? Where, where, where can we send them? Uh, yeah, just on Amazon. Just look uh, Fit for Success by Nick Shaw. And then if you want to follow me uh, personally on Instagram, it's uh, at nick.shaw.rp. <clears throat> and a lot of people uh, know RP as RP Strength on Instagram. Got you. Got you. Awesome. Well, look, Nick, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today. It's a lot of fun chatting with you. Again, great job on the book. Uh, I think people will walk away. Like I said before, people walk away. Something will resonate with them. Uh, and uh, congratulations, man. First, thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'm glad you like the book. And two, thanks so much for having me on. It's uh, really great. I love talking about all this stuff. I feel like I could probably sit here for four or five hours. So. <laughs> we can. I, I'm with you. We probably could. <laughs> awesome. uh, thanks again. Be well, Nick. Take care. Back we are here on the podcast. I want to give Nick a shout out. Thank you so much uh, for stopping by and and sharing your concepts and your insights, particularly around the period period of success. I think you laid out some really strong building blocks that were solid uh, and that lays out things quite nicely. Uh, I also appreciated uh, listening to Nick talk about the importance of mindset. And it's so key for us to bear in mind that any level of success that we're looking to achieve, it all starts with having the right mindset. So again, I walk away really, really appreciating of that. Um, 
Uh, to our listeners, I say thank you uh, for tuning in and, and checking out the podcast. Hey, if, if, if you haven't registered for email notifications of uh, content through the Audace Living podcast, you certainly can do so by heading over to, to our website, bestaudaciouslife.com. You enter your email and anytime there's new content becomes available, you get notified right away. So uh, definitely be sure to d- take an opportunity to do that. Um, we've reached an end of an episode and I want to thank our listeners. You know, you guys are the backbone to make this thing go. So I want to thank you once again for support, supporting the audacious living podcast and myself. Uh, it's always so great to share and we're going to keep this going, uh, for as long as we possibly can. Uh, like I said, end of the episode. So as always, I'll encourage you, uh, to stay safe, be kind, show love to one another and be audacious. You've been listening to the audacious living podcast hosted by Audley Stevenson. If you enjoy what you heard, be sure to like subscribe and share until next time. Be audacious.